Hey, what's going on, Any Push people? We have a good one for you today. This one is on the entire decade of the 1920s. I'm continuing my decade series here. And the 1920s is a very important time in U.S. history, so let's get started. All right, pre-1920s. We'll start with the Progressive Era, which was from the 1890s to, the, to 1920. And this is when we saw a lot of government regulation and involvement in the United States economy. World War I ended just prior to 1920, and the U.S. entered the war in 1917 due to the Zimmerman Note, in German unrestricted submarine warfare. Now here is the Zimmerman note. We notice that a German ambassador sent a telegram to Mexico urging them to attack the United States. And that really helped draw the United States into war. During World War I, we also see restriction on freedom of speech in which during times of crisis, your rights as an American do go down. And this was upheld by the court case Shank versus the United States in 1919. I have a video in the description, lots of videos in the description for you to check out. At the conclusion of the 19-teens, we have the first Red Scare. It's called the first one because there is a second one. And this was caused by a couple different things. The Russian Revolution in Russia, in which that country turns communist. An emergence of radical ideas in the country and immigration as well. And unions and immigrants were associated with radical ideas and communism. So let's take a look at these two political cartoons. We have a European anarchist. An anarchist is somebody who's against government. We see this European immigrant with a knife and a bomb in his hand sneaking up behind the Statue of Liberty. So he, according to the cartoon, is going to come and do damage to the United States. Now, labor unions, what begins as strikes, can lead to disorder, can lead to Bolshevism, can lead to chaos. That is the point of view of this political cartoon. So these really, these two political cartoons portray unions and immigrants in a negative light. We also have Sacco and Vanzetti, two immigrants, which we'll talk about. They're not necessarily during the Red Scare, but a continuation of this fear of immigrants and radical ideas. Let's jump on over to the election of 1820. We have Warren G. Harding versus James Cox, the Democrat, and Harding is a Republican. Harding campaigned on a return to normalcy. What does this mean? What's well, reverting to isolationism or neutrality and less government involvement. He's promoting the ideas of laissez-faire. And essentially, this is a turning away or an undoing of the progressive era. And as we can tell by this electoral college map, Harding wins in a landslide. He pretty much wins every state except those in the South, and he beats Cox 404 to 127. And Republicans would hold the presidency throughout the rest of the 20s until the election of 1932. All right, U.S. foreign policy in the 1920s, important to understand. Well, really in the beginning, we had the defeat of the Treaty of Versailles, and that's because of Article X and the creation of the League of Nations, which the U.S. did not join. Now, we see here this political cartoon, this, this bridge is missing a piece in the middle, and the keystone, or the most important part, is the USA. So the League of Nations was designed by the president of the U.S., Woodrow Wilson, but the U.S. did not join. So what was the U.S. relations with other countries like? Well, they followed a unilateral foreign policy, which really means one-sided or pursuing their own interests, not really getting into alliances or agreements with other countries. They had select military interventions, and this really was mostly in Latin America. Nicaragua, for example, the U.S. sent troops in between 1912 and 1938 to restore order and kind of invoke that Roosevelt corollary. International investment, we see a continuation of dollar diplomacy or, or banks and businesses investing in foreign countries. And the U.S. maintained isolationism as well. And that will really be the foreign policy theme carrying over to World War II. All right, let's talk about some social issues of the 1920s. We have the first great migration, and this is occurring during and after World War I. Again, it's called the first because we'll have a second one. This is when African Americans are leaving the South to the North and Midwest, and they're leaving due to segregation or Jim Crow laws, racial violence such as lynchings, and limited economic opportunities because really farming and sharecropping was the major source of income for many African Americans in the South. So they moved to the North and West, so we can see this political cartoon. They're moving to cities like Chicago in the North, New York, and then St. Louis out in the West. Now, they did find economic opportunities in these places, but they still faced discrimination. They also encountered lower paying jobs such as janitors, dishwashers, a lot of manual labor jobs. And a, an effect of the Great Migration is the Red Summer of 1919, which were race riots in many northern cities, especially in Chicago. So these were race riots between African Americans and whites in cities as a result of the Great Migration. Now, the well-known W.E.B. Du Bois during that time wrote about coming back from World War I in these race riots, and he wrote, This country of ours, despite all its better, should have done and dreamed 
is yet a shameful land. We return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Now let's jump on over to immigration. We have the Emergency Quota Act of 1921. This restricted the number of immigrants from a country to 3% of the total people from that country living in the U.S. in 1910. So, for example, there's 100 people living in the United States from Italy in 1910. Then they would only be allowed to have three immigrants come to the country in 1921. Now, the National Origins Act of 1924, signed by Calvin Coolidge here, this restricted immigration even further, and it cut the quota from 3% to 2%, and he used the 1890 census instead of the 1910. And the purpose of these acts was to put an end to unrestricted immigration. Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants that were charged with robbery and murder, and they were anarchists, atheists, and draft dodgers. So this really was a big fear in America during the 1920s, the ideas that they represented. Now, their trial really focused on their beliefs more than the evidence of whether or not they actually committed the crime. That is still up for debate, but historians pretty much agree they did not get a fair trial, and they were both executed in 1927 in Massachusetts. Okay, let's focus on the 1920s economy. The government took a laissez-faire approach, as I mentioned earlier, and Calvin Coolidge gave a famous quote that said, the business of government is business. And that really kind of summed up his view of the purpose of the government was to help out businesses. Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon, who was the Treasury Secretary for Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, so from 1921 to 1932, he advocated tax cuts for the wealthy. And this is very similar to Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush's tax plans of the 1980s and early 2000s, respectively. Farmers during the 1920s continued to produce at very high rates that outweighed demand, and this would lower crop prices. When in doubt throughout American history, when farmers are in debt, they end up producing more in the hopes of making money, but that drops the price further. That will be the case until we get to the New Deal. The stock market experienced a bull market for much of the decade, which means that continued to rise. But on October 29, 1929, we have Black Tuesday, the stock market crash, which many people point to as the start of the Great Depression. It's not the cause, but it's the start. And banks closed throughout the early 1930s as a result, and many people ended up losing their money. Jumping on over to cultural issues, we have gender roles are a very big topic during this time. Flappers, they would challenge gender norms. And these were women that drank, danced, smoked, cut their hair short, and wore shorter dresses. And when I say shorter dresses, that's for that time. These dresses are below the knee, and they were considered short for that time. Margaret Sanger emerged as a women's rights advocate and advocated birth control, which was very controversial during the 1920s. And we also have the proposed Equal Rights Amendment that was introduced in the 1920s but does not get approved by Congress until 1972. But even then, it does not get added to the Constitution you'll see in future videos. Modernism, we have the 1920 census. More Americans are living in cities for the first time in U.S. history, and many workers will lose autonomy in factories due to things like scientific management and the assembly line. Science versus religion is a hot topic, and this is evident through the John Scopes trial. Here is a biology teacher. I don't know about you, this guy just screams he's a science teacher to me. And he taught evolution in a Tennessee school, which was illegal to do in that state. And this trial really focused on literal inter on the literal interpretation of the Bible versus evolution. Okay, technology in the 1920s, we have emergence of very popular media, such as the radio, which is a huge source of entertainment. The plane of the, the novel War of the Worlds occurred in 1938, and we also have the emergence of soap operas and fireside chats under FDR when he becomes president. The cinema or movies develop, motion pictures become more popular, you have Nickelodeons, which cost a nickel to get into, movies during the Great Depression would be a huge source of cheap entertainment, and The Jazz Singer 1927 was the very first movie with sound. And also, of course, you can't talk about the 1920s and technology without the automobiles. The mass production was popularized and pioneered by Henry Ford. He did not invent the car, but he pioneered the mass production of it, and this allowed for vacations or personal mobility, and later, the growth of suburbs. Okay, the Harlem Renaissance, this focuses in Harlem, New York. This was a celebration of African-American culture through writing, music, art, you name it. And many African-Americans flocked to Harlem during the 1920s from the South. Again, that's part of the Great Migration. Some key figures you should be familiar with. You have Langston Hughes, this incredibly well-known writer. Here is a, one of his poems. This is, The night is beautiful, so the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, so the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun, 
beautiful also are the souls of my people. And the Harlem Renaissance really celebrated African American culture and African Americans as evidence as evident by this poem. Zora Neale Hurston was an author, a very well-known author during the time, and Duke Ellington was a jazz musician. And these are just three of the many, many people that took part in the Harlem Renaissance. Okay, other 1920s info, we have The Lost Generation. This is a group of writers that criticized 1920s culture and materialism. You see that in people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and The Great Gatsby, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, a bunch of other other authors and this will be similar to the beat generation of the 1950s many authors that also criticize middle class culture will come back to that in the 1950s marcus garvey is an influential leader and he advocated black nationalism or really black separatism from white culture and he founded the universal negro improvement association the unia and he promoted a back to africa movement that people from all over the world of african descent should move back to africa and he will inspire malcolm x in the 1960s so his ideas will carry through to the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s the kkk reemerges during this time and it's a reaction to new immigrants and the movie a birth of a nation which glorified the kkk and in addition to targeting African Americans, the KKK went after immigrants, Jews, and Catholics. All right, let's talk about some test tips for the 1920s. For multiple choice and short answer, be able to identify and describe the causes and effects of the first Red Scare, the Great Migration, nativism and immigration quotas, and of course, know the Harlem Renaissance. When it comes to essays, you could see a topic at comparing and contrasting, for example, the 1920s and the 1950s, or comparing and contrasting the Red Scares, the post-World Wars, culture of these decades, something like that. So this to me lends itself to a compare and contrast type of an essay. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. Check out my decades playlist and other videos in the description. I wish you nothing but the best of luck on all your exams, especially the one in May and have a good day.